Good morning, Jonathan. How you doing? I am doing great. How are you? Doing good. A uh, mutual friend of ours and company that you and I have both been working with, Scribe Media, has put us in touch um, because of the book that you guys have written. Um, yours is done. Mine is not. So I am still halfway up the really, really hard mountain. <laughs> I'm sure you've got lots of advice or uh, um, landmines to give me. But uh, before, we, before we kick it into it, Jonathan, I mean, you guys got some, pre- I think it's super timely um, with what your book is called, what you guys are preaching. And um, there's a lot of, like you and I were just talking about, there's a lot of parallels between what I have been talking about preaching and what you guys are talking about, because, you know, it's all about kind of starting with the end in mind. But maybe let's go back and you know, maybe give us a little bit of a debrief of what you guys are doing right now, what the book's called, and then what was your background and how did you get to where you are today? The book is Rock the Recession, and it's about why business leaders should look forward to the next recession as opposed to be afraid of it. And what was going on is that we, uh, Paul Belair, the co-author, and I, we started working on a workbook for all the companies that we coach and consult with. And so that was where the project started a couple years ago, just putting together exercises to help companies get ready for a recession. And then over the past two years, we realized that all the companies we work with really enjoy the workbook and the exercises. And so about a year ago, we decided that we should write the, what we're calling the book book to go (laughs) along with the workbook to really just tell the story of, our backgrounds and our expertise in recessions and then help others to have a great experience in the next recession. That's awesome, man. And like I said, it's super timely because the grumblings have started and, you know, they've kind of been, you know, going on and on. And I, I think it's uh, it's something that's in the minds of a lot of people. You and I were, I think you, you and I were talking about EOS and it's in the U.S. community where YPO, EO, Vistage and you know, a lot of people are looking at what's going on and how do we navigate this. I interviewed a guy named uh, Alex uh, Charvesky from Vista. Uh, he was like the Vistage um, economics guy. So this is a very, very timely. And I think you guys have a different approach to it and then and how you're actually viewing it instead of freaking out and, you know, having panic. So wh- Jonathan, what's your background and how did you end up ho- hooking up with uh, with Paul? And then what what is the actual infrastructure of, or the, the kind of the framework that you guys have built? So I actually went to the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, was a poli-sci major, and then graduated and got into investment banking and was working 100 hours a week. Uh, And because of that, in people years, it was like four years of experience. (laughs) Yeah, sleeping Uh, on cots. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, But learning everything that I got to learn there allowed me to become entrepreneurial. And so from there, started opening up gyms, uh, fitness businesses, which I know the audience would have a hard time believing if they saw me in person. (laughs) But really, my brother in law was kind of the gym rat in the family. And we got into opening up gyms. And through that process, that was the business that I owned in the last recession. And Brian, every business that you could think of, Owning personal training uh, gyms is probably the worst thing that you can be positioned to do in a recession. <laughs> people aren't people aren't willing to spend money for pain when they can't pay their bills. Dude, nobody wants to pay for <laughs> personal training in a recession. Nobody wants to pay for it when times are good. I was just so, say anytime, right? <laughs> yeah. So I mean, it, it's totally. I mean, what? It's a great excuse to be like, oh, uh, yeah. well, uh, economy's bad, can't work out. Uh, uh, so. <laughs> In any case, we were caught totally unprepared for the recession. And uh, the story is ended up borrowing a quarter of a million dollars from my mother-in-law to survive. Oh, geez. Yeah. The the worst part is that I didn't borrow it all at one time. I borrowed it uh, every two weeks. Oh, right as payroll was happening, I bet. <laughs> yeah. Payroll would come up and I would call her and we just, it was Groundhog's Day. Same conversation over and over and over, groveling for money. Can you send me a check for another $20,000? And uh, just imagine doing that over a dozen times. Mm. So out of that experience, um, I got hooked up with Paul, uh, my co-author on the book. And we were just put together through, you know, like the EO YPO mentorship program. Okay. Yeah. So we were randomly paired up uh, eight or nine years ago. And Paul helped me to navigate uh, getting through the recession, 
um, paying my mother-in-law back. And then uh, fast forward today, we've been working together for close to a decade and have become fast friends, put together this book together. Super cool. Do you guys still have the gym? Uh, my, so my brother-in-law bought me out of that business in early 2017. So he still has uh, the gyms and still does that part. And now I'm uh, doing full-time traction consulting and then author, speaker, that sort of thing. That's super cool. So Paul's got an interesting background too, because I mean, uh, and if, because you got the book and you've probably got a, a, and you do a lot of speaking and Jonathan, just let me know how you want to navigate this because I mean, you know, Paul's background is very interesting. And I think there's a, you know, there's a lot of grumbling, like we were talking about of what to do. And so I think his background and his story is very unique to how he handled it. And then maybe we can kind of go into the book and how you guys are, you know, how did the book workbook come across, come around? And then what, what are the fundamentals of it? Yeah, I mean, I should probably uh, talk for a sec about Paul's background, because otherwise your audience is going to tune out wondering why they should listen to the guy that uh, borrowed a quarter of a million bucks in the last recession. Uh, So Paul's background uh, is the complete opposite of mine in terms of what happened in the last recession. He's the counterpoint in that he and his team bought a business going into the Great Recession. They invested a million bucks and they grew the business during the Great Recession uh, over 63 months, so a little over five years, and then they sold it for over 70 million. Jeez, what was the what was the business? So HVAC company called Roth Brothers. Uh, so it wasn't exactly a sexy business uh, when yeah. they bought it. It was in uh, Youngstown, Ohio, and they were installing heating and air conditioning systems. So an HVAC contractor. Were they were they uh, like dis- uh, were they sales and distribution too? So sales and service. Really, they focused, uh, when Paul and his team bought the business, it was 80% installation and 20% service, meaning that most of their projects were somebody's HVAC uh, would stop working and they would go replace the unit. What Paul and his team did was that they saw the recession coming. They understood that people would want to spend on service in a recession to keep their old existing equipment um, working. Mm -hmm. Instead of making the big CapEx investment in a new uh, heating or air conditioning system. And so they pivoted the whole company to service from construction. So in the space of uh, just a little bit of time, they took it from 80% installation and 20% service to the exact opposite, to 80% service and 20% installation. Holy cow. I mean, I couldn't even imagine like what was the, what was the growth in employees and maybe this is part of the, some of your, the book, but like how, you know, managing that amount of employees and have, I'm assuming they had to have institutional systems that they were putting in place and stuff like that, but to grow it that much and that fast, it's pretty crazy. Well, they did what I don't think a lot of companies do. They sat down and they spent some time whiteboarding (laughs) out their strategy (laughs) and actually thinking about what they were going to do, how they were going to do it, and creating a real strategy. A strategy, um, by my definition, is something that creates a competitive advantage. And I don't think a lot of companies, at, at least a lot of the ones that I start working with, don't do that. Or they just look at me like I'm crazy when I ask them, it, when how often they get together and figure out their competitive advantage. But back to Paul's story, they decided that they were going to take it from a local Youngstown, Ohio company to a national company and that they were going to subcontract the work. So instead of them having to grow people and have tons of people on payroll, which creates a lot of risk, mm-hmm. especially for contractors and a lot of payroll liability, they got really good at being able to get the contracts And then they would subcontract them to others to perform the actual service. And that created massive value that allowed them to get a a big return multiple or a big exit multiple so that they could have an American dream exit. That's awesome. So a couple questions about him and then we can uh, kind of dive into the methodology and stuff that you guys are talking about. Where did he get the money? The the million million bucks, was it like a like a small little PE fund or was it just family and friends? And then was like, did he have investors that he had to return? And was there an exit, at, you know, from the very beginning? But kind of what's the overall concept behind, you know, a layer deeper? Man, nobody's ever asked me that question. Um, he, uh, the million dollars came from Paul and his four management team members. So hmm. there were five of them total. 
and Paul put up a portion of the money and the rest of his team each put up uh, their savings and together they pulled a million in cash to buy the company. Did they the, use like an SBA loan or something like that? They didn't. The, uh, the rest of what the company cost was funded by uh, the seller. Hmm. So the seller was First Energy. And part of the deal was that this was uh, all happening around when First Energy, there, there was a big brownout on the East Coast back in the early 2000s. I don't know if you, you remember reading about that, but in any case, mm-hmm. big brownout, First Energy's board got together and said that First Energy, the energy utility, needed to sell all of its non-core assets. And one of those non-core assets was this uh, this rock HVAC on. company. Oh, rock on. So you actually bought it from institutional <laughs> company too. So you're not you're not going and picking up this you know, the scraps of some some person that hadn't really run. I mean, interesting. Well, no, Paul's Paul's a CPA and an MBA, and he was running the company for First Energy. And so uh, they kind of got together, and it was just a right place, right time sort of a deal. So he was so- running it before he bought it from them. <laughs> Correct. Yeah. And they um, were under mandate from the board to spin it out. And so Paul um, and his team decided that they were going to put in their cash and, and buy it out. Oh, my gosh. So due diligence probably didn't take too long if you were the one running the business. Exactly. No, I think in, that was why it was so convenient for uh, First Energy as well, because they knew that it would be a quick transition and they had somebody with a track record working on it. So I think they were confident that they'd be able to get paid on the seller's note. Oh my gosh. That's so it wasn't just a thought. It wasn't just a million bucks. There was a seller's note too. So that wasn't the complete value. Correct. Okay. Correct. Yeah. So, I mean, the company was, was already doing pretty well, so there was more to it, but that was the deal that they put together. That's amazing. So it, what, what year was that? Uh, so I have to do the math backwards here, but it was in oh, yeah. the oh, mid two thousands. So okay. leading up to the great recession. So call it a, a six, seven, eight, timeline. Okay. So then, you know, maybe, I don't know how much you want to get into his exit because I'm, I, I'm kind of trying to weave together your timeline and his timeline that, that kind of led to the book and what your guys' philosophy is. So like, as he was, you know, looking at the business differently and like, you know, switching to service and stuff like that, what, you know, what, the reason I asked of like, you know, what, where the money came from and what the intentions and if there was an exit is because so many times, you know, the, I mean, PE firms, that's how the PE managers make their money is through the carried interest. So they have to liquidate it versus family office. Everybody's different. So where you get your money is different from the intentions. So like, did he and his team think, okay, like we have a timeline, we have a valuation, or was it just grow this son of a gun as fast as possible? And so how did that, how did he view that, especially as the recession was hitting? I mean, what, you follow my question here? Sorry. Yeah, for sure. No, the if you in the book, you'll read the gory details about this. But the idea here was that Paul and his team, they knew that they wanted to exit from the beginning. So they had an exit plan at the start. And then they worked backwards from the exit they wanted to achieve to understand what their next steps should be. And Mm -hmm. so Paul talks about he's a big um, proponent of backward forward planning, (laughs) where you begin with the end in mind and then figure out what you need to do today to start making that reality that you want to realize come into focus. So they absolutely had a plan for how they were going to do this. With, uh, I was just curious, who did they sell to? They sold to uh, Fortune 50. And I don't remember, yeah, I don't remember if we, uh, if I can... Yeah, I, or not, which is fine. I was just curious. Yeah. If it was like, no, I, mainly I was more thinking, Jonathan, whether it was a private equity or a financial buyer. Yeah, you know what? It, I, I'm, it, I'm like 99% sure it was public. Otherwise, Sodexo can sue me. Um, but I don't think they'll really care about me. But they seem <laughs> Sodexo. Okay. Yeah. And, and if it's public, then yeah. Because like the strategic versus financial buyers play different multiples for different strategic reasons. And, you know, that in, in, as we kind of get into this, you and I were talking before we got on the show, Jonathan, like, of like thinking with the end in mind. And, you know, that's our whole growth and exit framework with the five principles and your rock of the recession. I mean, it's kind of the fundamentals are, you know, start with the end in mind, look at value creation. Before we get into it, why do you think so many people don't think like this, like the backward forward thinking? I mean, is it, is it too difficult or like, you know, because it makes so much freaking sense. (laughs) It's like, it's difficult for me to wrap my head around why it's difficult for people to step out of it into thinking like this? 
Yeah, I think it really depends on what size company that we're talking about. Yeah. And at companies, so 97% of companies are under a million in revenue. And so the vast majority just don't have the bandwidth because a lot of times if you're doing a million or less in revenue, you're also the chief cook and bottle washer. So you're executing a lot of your service or executing a lot of creating your product Mm -hmm. in addition to running your business. And with all of that time taken up, it doesn't leave a lot left to go to Starbucks and think about blue sky to come up yeah. with a compelling strategic, a uh, compelling strategy that gives you a competitive advantage. Mm-hmm. And it probably isn't until you get closer to 10 to 25 million that you have enough people on your team that it frees you up to go think about that big picture. Yeah, that's a... I- I would agree with that because one of the biggest challenges we've been launching at boot camps is because they're two and a half days to get people. It's not the five grand; it's the two and a half days that's the problem. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, like, I mean you can understand the ROI on the five grand. It makes sense, and you can even understand the ROI in your time. But in a lot of cases, if somebody's like, "Look, if I'm not here, there's nobody to make the widget," or if I'm not here, then we're not getting paid then you're just kind of jammed that way. I mean, when Paul, all this is easy to talk about because Paul's company, when they bought it, was already at a run rate of close to 50 million. And so there's layers of overhead. There's layers of management that allow Paul and his executive leadership team to go hold themselves up at a Hilton or a Marriott for the day and Mm -hmm. think about the future and whiteboard it out. And so it is a big challenge. But look, Ryan, I mean, my recommendation is that people spend 16 hours And that's what Paul and I have come up with. You need to invest 16 hours in coming up with your recession plan if you want to be ready to rock the recession. And so that's what Paul did. That's what I did. Um, That's what we recommend in the book. I recommend that too, just on the personal front. A lot of people don't have a life plan, let alone a recession plan. And if you're willing to just let life take you uh, wherever it will, that's cool for you. But I'm all for figuring out where I want to go and then putting that down on paper and getting after it. So true. I mean, and I there's so many quotes that I probably not going to do correctly, but it's like, you know, if you're not planning, someone else will plan for you and <laughs> things just happen. You know, where did, you know, Jonathan, where did the rock the recession come from? Like, where was the inception? You guys said you started like working together and there was a workbook, but like, you know, you guys are obviously thinking ahead of time and, you know, now there's, there's actual grumblings because things are starting to creak and wobble within the economy and the financial systems and stuff. But like, you know, as you guys started talking about this, what, what were, cause you're an EOS implementer as well, right? So like, what were some of the, some of the variables or some of the situations that, that came to, to be that allowed you guys to let's say, okay, there's something here. I, I wish I could say that I, we had a master plan and that we whiteboarded out our strategy to rock the recession. Really what happened is that Paul and I both have a lot of experience with contractors, with uh, companies that build things. And so we started to get nervous about our contractors because in the great recession, from 2008 to 2010, contractors just got their asses kicked. I mean, they because of the housing bubble, they disproportionately felt the last uh, downturn. Mm-hmm. And a lot of our clients that I'm doing the EOS consulting with and a lot of the clients that Paul's coaching are contractors. And we started to think through what are the exercises that we wish um, contractors would do to get ready for the next recession Mm -hmm. And we started to kind of put that down in what we called a workbook. It was just kind of a loose collection of exercises. And and the the thing that really got us, Ryan, is that, man, we were tired of the plan being to always just turtle up and try to survive the recession. (laughs) Right. Like that, we find that to be pretty boring. Uh, That's not what this is all about. This is about how to rock the recession from the standpoint of if you know that a recession's coming, then what would you do now to prepare for it so that you could kick ass and take names when it actually hits? So Mm -hmm. things like, I want to buy other companies. I want to buy assets from companies that didn't plan for the recession. Mm -hmm. Or maybe you've heard um, it's really hard to hire people right now since unemployment's at record lows. Mm -hmm. In a recession, though, it'll be a lot easier to hire people. But you can't just... Uh, they're not going to announce recession on CNN or Fox or MSNBC and all of a sudden people are going to flood you. 
you're going to need to have a list together before the recession of who you want to hire. Mm -hmm. Like who are the A players that you would love to get your hands on, but you can't get your hands on them because they're happily at work right now. Mm -hmm. But in a recession, people get nervous, the situation gets uncertain, and then those A players, they can be wooed to come over to your company, especially if they believe that you have a good plan for the recession. Yeah, I mean, well said. I mean, it's not like, because it, it's it's different in the private markets than I think a lot of people when they think about the recession, they think about, oh, I'm going to buy stocks, <laughs> right? Where then most of these assets are privately held companies, right? So it's just different where you don't have to have, it's not the war. I mean, it, obviously that that's definitely an option of being the Warren Buffett where you have a bunch of cash and you go buy stocks. But like, this is, you're talking about like building valuable privately held companies compared to what other people are not ready for. Cause people, I mean, I seen the balance sheets of a lot of privately held companies and I, I don't know what the EOS practice or your other guys' practice that you guys do, but there's a lot of debt out there and there's not a lot of cash. So like if you can figure out ways and have these lists, I mean, that, 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 yeah, that's stuff that it's right now is very difficult to do. So what are the different, yeah, yeah, think, can we, can we geek out on that point for yeah, a minute for sure. that you just made? <laughs> sure. For sure. So like when you're talking balance sheets, here's what Paul and I are thinking. If you, I want you to take whatever your projected next 12 months of revenue is, and you should have at least five to 10% of whatever that number is, as equity on your balance sheet. Mm -hmm. So for example, if you're a million dollar company and you're expecting to do a million dollars in business over the next 12 months, that means that I want you to have between 50 and 100,000 in equity on your balance sheet for you to know that you're ready, that you're liquid enough, that you have enough cash on hand, that if everything goes to hell in a handbasket, that you'll be comfortable surviving the next recession. And if you're closer to that 10% plus mark, that you'll be able to buy other companies that don't have that kind of equity on their balance sheet because they're not going to be in position in the next recession. And oh, so if you're, yeah. if you're looking to do like 20 million in business in the next 12 months, then you want to have somewhere between yeah. that, I mean, two, that two, one two, to 2 million in, yeah. in equity on your balance sheet. Well, and like in, in actual equity to me, I mean, if we wanted to go really geeky on this, I mean, like, cause you know, so many times, Jonathan, it's like, oh yeah, like you go in there and you normalize the EBITDA and you do all these things and then like, oh, there's 2 million bucks here, but like, that's not $2 million in cash. You know what I mean? That, those are accounting measures to figure in gap to be able to figure out what it is. But like, you're talking free cash flow and equity. That's actual yeah, money. No, to <laughs> totally. I'm, I'm totally with you. I'm talking uh, liquid or near liquid um, equity. Mm -hmm. So this is either cash in, in the bank or cash that you can put your hands on in under 90 days and preferably close to 30. Mm -hmm. Well, and so let you know, when you think about being prepped and ready for like this, because I do believe that, you know, if you layer what you just said, like, a, I'll kind of set the stage here, maybe and I, again, we could go whatever direction you want is so the, of the 95% of the companies that are below a million bucks, at least five, five percent of companies. So of, of the 6 million privately held companies, that's essentially, I think it's, it, it's like 400,000 companies that are above 5 million revenue <laughs> in the whole US. And so like, there's like how to actually prep this, you know, when you layer that plus the fact that two thirds of them are baby boomers. So, you know, when you talk, you and I were talking about the timelines and people getting burnt out and all that stuff. Cause like, if you do this, I just don't understand how someone that's gone through this multiple times is willing to put their head in the sand because <laughs> of, of how painful it is. And then flipping and how, how exciting it is to be able to think about that you can do things like you just decided or to just described to actually grow your company and still sell it and prosper in a, in a recession. I mean, maybe that kind of tees up the four different um, gears that you talked about, unless you wanted to kind of speak to anything that I just said. I, I, I like that. The only thing I would do is kind of reframe it because before we started, um, we, we should have turned on the microphone when you and I first started <laughs> talking because we were kind of geeking out there having a good conversation. But the um, I, I just want the baby boomers to see this as their chance, man. Like if, right. you're, if you're out there and you're listening to this and you're a baby boomer and you're tired and you're thinking about um, selling the company, retiring, um, transitioning to the next generation – this is a big chance. That's what recessions do. That's why I'm pumped about it. It's like you have an opportunity for this to be a big event that really allows you to get into position to be able to sell the company. But now's your time. If you don't see this next recession coming, 
and you wait until we're in the depths of the recession, oh, then man. you're going to sell at a loss or you're going to end up just shutting the business down or you're not going to realize anywhere near the multiple, the value uh, that you could have if you sold right before uh, the crash happens. I mean, same thing with your house. Like now is the time. We're at the peak of the market um, in housing. We're at the peak of the market with businesses. So this is a great time to sell. And otherwise, you're going through another cycle. So if you don't say, sell yeah, now, yeah. You're, you're, you know, plan to spend another three to five years until the market goes through a downturn and then climbs back out. Well, it's funny because like, you know, let's, let's dive into a couple of those things. Down. I think it was, I actually interviewed one of the top investment bankers in Canada. And he said, if you don't sell right now, you're literally going to sell in five years for the same price. <laughs> and I was like, that's, you know, depending on the, the, the size company, obviously there's a lot of layers behind that. But so, yeah, you're right. And, but like, now let, like, let's take this example of like, you know, you and I were talking about certain size companies where, you know, the, it just do, doesn't make sense to sell. Right. And so there's this kind of hamster wheel that I think 85% of entrepreneurs are in. And I literally, I, I mean, if I had a dollar for every time I heard it come out of someone's mouth, cause I can do a quick dirty math. Let's say you're a $5 million revenue company. You're doing 500 grand in EBITDA times it by four gives you $2 million take away 45% in taxes plus some debt leaves you with like 900 grand. And you're probably used to pulling 250 out of the company. And so you go, well, why would I ever sell? <laughs> right. And, and then, but then all of a sudden you're getting super tired, right? So you keep, keep running that math for decades and then you just get tired as you're going into a recession. But if you think about like what you're talking about, if they, if someone with a decent amount of infrastructure there can prep themselves, they could grow to the point where, cause if you can get the 2 million in EBITDA, I mean, you're going from a, you know, a three to four to a six potentially. So you're, I mean, that's the difference between five and $10 million valuation roughly because you're increasing the multiple two. So like, and you're able to do that because of the other companies that didn't prep. I mean, I don't know, it could, it, maybe you, you see a lot of companies too. So I, I was just kind of setting the context because that was some of the stuff we were talking about. Yeah, I think uh, the, the where I would start is always with first gear, which is just assessing your situation. So even before we get into all the, the fancy stuff, all the concepts that you and I are kind of throwing back and forth between EBITDA and multiples and uh, tax rate, all that stuff. The first thing is just to be aware enough to do an assessment and see where you're at. So do you understand how ready you are for the next recession? Do you know what your company's value is right now? And I don't think most business leaders even know the answers to those questions. Mm -hmm. And without understanding where you're starting from, I don't think you can take another step. So that's first <laughs> right. gear is yeah. just assessing your situation. Uh, there, you know, in that process, uh, we so recession.com is our website. And if you go to recession.com slash ready, uh, there's a free 20 question assessment, which will help you to figure out if your company is ready for a recession. Um, but beyond that, it's talking to your accountant, it's talking to your lawyer and your financial planner. That's really your team to help you understand everything that you just rattled off. You should really know I'm at 5 million, I've got 500,000 in EBITDA. This is what a common multiple is right now for a business my size in my industry after taxes, if I sold it, this is how much I would clear. And this is what that means for me on a monthly income basis. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and this is, you know, just to shed some light of why we have our practice is that that what you and I just rattle back and forth is, is very complicated. It doesn't have to be that complicated, I guess, is my whole point behind this, Jonathan, is, you know, I, I can't, if I had, how many financial planners which are the, I, the, the, those three that you just named, so the legal, the CPA, the wealth providers, all of them are so necessary to provide a 360 degree view of this. The biggest challenge that I've seen, Jonathan, is that this valuation world is so not addressed correctly because, I mean, a lot of times the financial planners, they don't have a, you know, a huge, well, you know, versed into valuation. So they, they like listen to the owners and they, they slap it on the financial plan. It's 5 million bucks. And then the CPA doesn't necessarily know company specific risk from a buyer's perspective. So there's this whole like gap that I see. And I don't know if you see the same thing as far as like what a company truly is value because, you know, and then the, the legal structure is like, you, you don't get all the money up front most of the time. You know what I mean? Unless it's an SBA one. So I just, I, ch I challenge people to make sure that they understand that because you know, I don't know if you see the same thing. I mean, it's just difficult to actually get a clear picture of where you're at. 
Dude, I got a solution for you. So I think the audience needs to think through who their accountant is and who their financial planner is and their lawyer. In most cases, it's probably the same person that they've been with since they started their company. <laughs> and yeah. so I think that's part of it too. Like if you've got a $5 million business, you're in the top 3% of all businesses in the United States, if we're just talking about the US audience. And you should be working with a lawyer, an accountant, and a financial planner that work with the top 3% of business owners. <laughs> right, right. Most of the time, uh, though, we stick with the guy that um, we started with or the woman that we started with because we don't want to upset them because they're at our country club or because they are our neighbor or they're um, friends with, you know, their um, kids play with our kids. But this is your net worth and your retirement we're talking about. So you need to get a CPA and a financial planner that are comfortable um, talking through business exits and have a track record of helping owners of businesses exit their business. And preferably, you should not be the largest client. Or the first one. Professionals. <laughs> yeah. yeah, or their first. Yeah, I mean, if you're, um, if, even if it's your EOS implementer, if you're the largest client of your implementer, then you have to really think that through. Like you want to be working with somebody that's got a hundred million dollar business on their roster. Mm -hmm. If that's where you're trying to get to, if you're a $5 million company and you're looking to exit your lawyer, your CPA should be able to talk about, they should rattle off three clients that all had $10 million businesses that they helped walk through the process. That would give me comfort. If it's your guy that you've been with for forever and he doesn't regularly help people exit their businesses at least his friends don't exit for any worthwhile um, amount, then you got to really think that through. And that can oh, be a, a tough call. Oh, it is. It is. I mean, like, hey, here's the difference between an asset and a stock. So, I mean, like, honestly, our CPA, Jonathan, big firm here in town, and I think we were his third transaction ever. <laughs> Just like, and we didn't know that, you know, and <laughs> it's like, okay, do you know how to al like allocate the asset sale of a multi-million dollar company? And some, well, they don't even necessarily know how to do that. You know, it's just, and it's hard. I mean, and, and again, you know, to give, to give, you know, to flip it on the, 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 the listener too, is making sure that the listeners, got the, the owner has to have kind of some of their shit together to be able to give these professionals the ability to succeed too. You know what I mean? Cause I, <laughs> it, it, there's, a, there's definitely a two way street there. Yeah, I totally get. It. I mean, one crazy thought I have for uh, the audience still listening to us going back and forth here <laughs> is that I've always wanted to ask my professionals to see their tax returns. Yeah. Like that's the, the other thing I'm thinking through is if my lawyer, accountant, or financial planner don't have a net worth that's somewhat comparable to where I want to be, then why am I taking their advice? <laughs> It's so true. Oh my God. I mean, there, there's a guy that, and this is way down a rabbit hole, but there's a guy, some, some people I know that are wealth managers here in town and he went bankrupt twice. Like, I mean, what? <laughs> like, does that make any sense? And I, mean, I know that, I know that people roll their eyes when I bring this up and they're like, I can't ask my accountant to see their, uh, their tax return. I don't know. Same thing with all the advisors helping your business. I mean, I'm, happy to share with my clients uh, my tax return because I get to see theirs. And so again, I think just out of reciprocity, it's like, you know, show me mine, I'll show you, let me see yours, that, that sort of thing can just help business owners to figure out if they're with the, the right advisors, which, as you pointed out, is just critical. Well, so, yeah, and it's, it's, it's even on the same point, and then we can keep going with your gears, yeah. because I want to make sure we cover them all is, is, you know, as the seller goes to sell, like you said, really putting your head on the, your shoulders and you are in the top 3%. So like when someone wants to buy you, they want your cash flow if you've built a good company. So you ask them to see their balance sheet. I mean, there's no reason you can't see private equity or a third party sale or even the third, whoever it is, show me your balance sheet and how I'm going to get paid when I'm going to get paid, especially if you're agreeing to earn outs or seller financing or anything. Yeah, totally. I, the, so second gear, um, by way of, uh, uh, just a hard segue is that so first year was that you uh, you're going to benchmark your readiness for the next recession, you're going to assess where your company's at, 
um, where you're at as an individual. The second gear is to tune up your business or to tune up your personal life. And what I mean by that are performing a whole series of stress tests. So one of them is that that equity test that we talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. Do I have five to 10% of my next 12 months of projected revenue as equity on my balance sheet? The other big one, and one of the things I'm most excited about or that I get uh, a lot of feedback on is where do you stand uh, with your personal guarantees? Mm -hmm. So if you've got a personal guarantee on your debt with your bank, now is the time when the market is strong to go back to your bank and say, I'd like to remove my personal guarantee. Now, please. <laughs> I'd like to cap it. I'd like to see what we could do to reduce it so that my exposure isn't the full $5 million that I owe your bank. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people have had success with this right now because right now in the economy, banks are hungry for client business. Oh my God, it's they're starving for margins because of the low interest rates. And so a lot of times though, Ryan, you do have to change banks to make this work. Mm -hmm. It is very hard for your existing bank to release your personal guarantee. I think just what happens is they go to credit committee and they're like, hey, uh, Ryan's one of our good clients. Um, he's been with us for a long time. He has four million outstanding on his line of credit. We, we have uh, personal guarantees. <laughs> yeah, we have a blanket personal guarantee and he's asking for us to reduce it. What do you all think? <laughs> And so that conversation doesn't go great. I think, though, if you go to other banks and they're like, look, we've got this great um, potential client. Um, his name's Ryan. He's got a company. He's got a $4 million um, facility. We really want to win him over. But Ryan's saying that he'll only do it if we cap his personal guarantee at a million. Can we do it? I think you've got a better chance of that story working. And so we, I've had a lot of clients that have been very successful with this, able to reduce their personal guarantees. Yep. Um, so again, I think that's one huge takeaway um, that's working well. Yeah, actually, I've got a client and friend who uh, got rid of an SBA, went from a, like a 10-year with all the personal guarantees and all the fees to a conventional 20 year with no personal guarantees, just on pure cash flow. <laughs> I mean, cause the banks need margin and need, need profit so bad right now. Yeah. And the SBAs, I, I don't, I've never heard of a case where the SBA is going to release you from a personal I guarantee. I don't think so either. <laughs> but so, but that, that idea that you just brought up. So if anybody's out there listening and has an SBA loan, which I know a lot of small businesses do, and can get their bank to pick it up as a conventional loan and bring it um, in-house. That's what we're talking about. So again, that second gear is just about all these stress tests, making sure that you're thinking through what can you do now while economic times are good to position yourself so that if things don't go great in a recession, that you're protected as much as possible. The other part of second gear tuning up is building your war chest so that when we get to third gear, which is race mode, then you can actually do things like buy other companies, buy assets, or bring over a level talent to your business. Can I? Yeah, no, I'm I'm totally tracking that. I think the the tactical things that you're talking about is amazing too. And I think, I mean, I skimmed. I didn't have all the time to read your the 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 pre-release of your book, but I was I was grasped most of it. And you know, I think there's an over overlap in in our in our preaching and our philosophies of in your tune up. So in principle uh, four of our five growth next principles, it's increased value, which all we're trying to say, Jonathan, is, is create sustainable, predictable, and transferable cash flow. So largest customers, contracts, assignable contracts, all this stuff that allows you to, you know, essentially have a cash flow machine. So then therefore you can go buy all this stuff. So I don't know. I mean, I think you, you touch on a couple of things there, but I think there's a solid overlap of do all this stuff that makes you investment grade for private equity or for anybody, because then you can do whatever you want. Yeah, I look, we just call it good business hygiene, <laughs> Ryan. I mean, it's stuff like the it's stuff that you should be doing anyways, as a business owner. A lot of these uh, tune up items, though, become so much more critical right now, because you don't get to do them when we're in a recession. Like you can't go to your bank when we're in a, a downturn or <laughs> when the economy is contracting and be like, I want a, uh, I want a bigger line of credit. <laughs> right. Yeah, they're going to laugh like you are right now. Or if you go to them and you're like, hey, I know that I have a, a blanket personal guarantee. I'd really like to talk to you all <laughs> about um, releasing me. <laughs> yeah. No, we're considering keeping you or not. So how about that? <laughs> yeah, we're considering calling your loan. 
So at this point, it's a no. So I, again, the, there's a window of opportunity right now. And that's where um, if you're going to do second gear, it needs to be right now. Um, mm-hmm. Otherwise, if we're talking about the same topic when we're already in a downturn, then I would skip second gear and I would go right to third gear. So I want people to understand too, our model isn't linear, yep. which is a little bit confusing. It's not like you always do first, then second, then third, then fourth gear. You always start with first, but then depending where we're at in the economic cycle, you'll jump to second, third, or fourth gear, depending on uh, what's going on. So, and and before we get into the sec- uh, the third gear, because I um, is... You know, when I think about like what you guys are talking about, Jonathan, and like what, what I preach, which is start with the end in mind. I think, you know, the, the the benefit that you guys have with the recession kind of the you've anchored yourself in that is there's something that's going to there's an actual like finite thing that's going to happen versus just start with the end in mind where like if you if you do your backwards forward thinking like you were talking about, like you're going to view your company like this because it, it's hard to have a conversation with your biggest customer about getting a contract or it's hard work to have these conversations with your bank. But like if you have a very, very specific thing that's going to happen, that's going to be bad, like you're going to it's worth the pain. Like kind of going back to your personal training examples, right? Where like, I just, I just want to kind of note that it is hard work to do that stuff, but there's a very specific reason. And instead of, I don't know, Jonathan, it is, I see so many people try to play the annual tax game instead of like I was explaining to you, flipping the, the, the mindset to three-dimensional thinking of thinking about value in their company instead of just, I didn't pay very many you know dollars in taxes this year, because then you'll go have these hard conversations and do the hard work. Yeah, so I you're just talking about the the burning platform. Like the you know, there is a definite recession coming. It's like the seasons of the year. You know, summer always follows spring, fall follows summer, winter follows fall. Winter is equivalent to a recession and winter is coming. And so your business though, you don't have to sell it at any specific point. You can always decide I'm gonna wait five years and then I'm going to sell it. That's you're always at choice on that front. Mm -hmm. So unless you've got something in your life that's driving action, you're just going to kind of be stuck. And so that the what you brought up earlier with like personal training, a lot of people start personal training when they have a life event. So if they have a wedding coming up, there's a good chance that they'll want to spend some money on personal training because they want their wedding pictures to have them looking good. Mm -hmm. You know, also right after a divorce, Great time to pick up personal training clients because <laughs> people are back on the market. They need to look good for that next person that they're going to be um, getting together with, you know? Yep. 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 So <laughs> I like, I mean, I think it's just, it's just good to note because it's, you know, there's, there's some, there's an actual reason to do the hard work. So what, what, explain the race, the third gear and what, what, what's inside of that. You're doing all the stuff uh, like making sure that your culture is strong making sure that you have a continuous improvement plan in place, making sure uh, that you have a way at your company to measure productivity. These are all the things that you want to be doing when our economy is starting to uh, contract. Because if you don't already have a strong culture when things are contracting, then you're really going to have a rough go in a downturn because it is easy to maintain a good culture when the economy is good. But when things start to slide, when you start to have people considering things like layoffs or considering reductions in pay, or we can't do as big of an expense reimbursement for um, vehicles, that's when you get to see what the company culture is really made out of. That's where we get to test how strong the culture really is. So third gear is all about making sure that you're set for fourth gear which is where you get to really hit the gas and accelerate past the competition. So describe what that means. What the third gear, um, the fourth gear, like the what race and path, like what what are the like tactical and things that are happening inside of like the race past the competition and like what, what, like what are some of the actions that people are taking in that gear? Yeah. So let's talk about um, freeing up people that aren't A and B players. So in our world, Paul and I are defining an A player is someone that if you shut down your company or if you left your company to go to another company, who are the A players? And what we mean by that are who are the people that you would have to take with you? Mm-hmm. So say that you know we're in business and I'm like, you know, Ryan, I don't really like it here. We're not getting treated right. This place sucks. Let's go across the street and start a competing business. 
then you would be one of my A players because I'm like, you know, I'm not leaving here without Ryan. He mm -hmm. has got to be with me because if Ryan goes with me, I know that we can kill it no matter where we go and what we're going to do. Mm -hmm. That small group of people are generally your A players. Yeah. Uh, I mean, and, and there's so many things behind that too. I mean, A players, by the way, don't like to work with B and C players. <laughs> It's just not as fun. So they yeah, can, I mean, they, they may put up with B players and A players may even coach B players to become A players. Mm -hmm. But if an A player looks around and they're surrounded by C players, they're going to be posting their resume. They're going to be taking the next call from a headhunter or recruiter because, uh, yeah, they don't like to hang out with other with other people that aren't A players. And because of their position, they get to do that. But as business owners and business leaders we don't spend a lot of time taking stock of who we have on our team mm -hmm. and we don't free up the C players. And the big reason is complacency. And right now I see it all over the place because it's been 10 plus years since we've had a downturn. So there hasn't been that, that burning platform that we talked about earlier. There hasn't been that reason why this is the time where we have to get rid of all the C players. And so we keep making excuses. We don't new, do what we need to do. You know, we're like, eh, I don't really need to go work out. I'll start another time. Working out is tough. I don't want to do it today. Right. And I think, you know, I agree with you wholeheartedly. And I got some of my own personal stories I could share about it. But the, you know, I, I think we also have to do realize that there's some people are starving for just bodies to fill roles too. So maybe it's, I mean, I don't know if you want to, cause I would probably, I, well, I mean, I totally agree with you, Jonathan, but it's more of like, okay, at the top, make sure that you got your A players because those are going to be the people that are rowing when the, you know, the tides are in the waves are hitting the, hitting the boat. Because I mean, my, my personal example was, you know, like back when I was telling you when we had to essentially turn ours around after the last crisis, I mean, I turned around and, you know, we, we had a whole new executive team and everything like that, which, I mean, we were in the shit storm, but like they were still, we were all still having fun. You know what I mean? We were still taking the punches together and you, I mean, we created ridiculous camaraderie because of the fight that we were all doing together, which made it easier for everybody versus like, you know, you have one person, you know, in that mix, that's not pulling their weight and you really feel it more than anything. Yeah. I mean, have you, um, have you ever been dog sledding? I have not, but so, I think I know where you're going with this. Yeah, I mean, I, I've had the opportunity to go uh, a couple times, and most recently with my daughters, uh, they're six and eight. If you're okay. out there listening and you've got kids and they're around that age range, I highly recommend going dog sledding. They okay. love it. But the, the one thing that really got me about dog sledding is that I had, there were eight dogs on my sled, and uh, we took a break, and I was asking our guide, what was up with the dog that was closest to the sled, like was at the back of the chain. And he said that the dog's name was Nanook. And he was like, well, what did you notice? And I was like, well, what I noticed is that that dog ran just fast enough to keep up, but not fast enough to take any weight and help pull the sled. And he was like, exactly. He was like, I put her on there not to help pull the sled, but just because she needs to get some exercise. <laughs> But she, um, she's just, she's not taking any weight. She's just along for the ride, making sure she doesn't get drugged by the sled. And we all have Nanooks at our companies. So all I'm saying, Ryan, I know it's easy to be the consultant guy, you know, like, like me or like, and come along and say, hey, you need to get rid of all your C players and hire only A players. I know people roll their eyes and they're like, he doesn't get it. All I'm saying is start with freeing the Nanooks. Mm -hmm. If you've got people at the company that are just running fast enough to just keep up, but not take any weight off the sled, just start with them because they are the ones pissing off all the uh, the sled dogs that are running fast enough. And if your sled dogs turn around and see Nana not pulling, they will stop pulling as well. So at least get rid of those. And then, then we can talk about next steps. I know that it's hard. I know 3.7% 3, 3 unemployment. I get it war on talent, but at least free the Nanooks. Let them go to your competitors and not pull their sleds. Well, and like, and actually, and I agree with you too. I'm all fronts as far as the, you know, the people that are not in the shit storm, you know, giving too much advice, but it's, it, it is good advice and it's very true. Right. I mean, cause now I'm on the other side, right. Where before I was the one in the middle of the storm. And um, I think, you know, to your point though, 
that that Nanook wasn't even pulling any weights. Most of the time when you actually let them go, it frees up cash flow. And also everybody's able to take on the work because there was not that much getting done anyways, <laughs> if anything at all. Yeah. So once you've kind of got your, your, your foundation, how do you rock the recession and actually capitalize on, you know, literally riding the wave in the, in the right direction because you've prepped yourself? Yeah. Fourth gear is just accelerate. So this is where we're in a downturn or in a recession, and now you're just going to let it rip. This is you're going to buy other companies. You're going to um, purchase assets from the companies that uh, didn't listen to Life After Business, didn't listen to our podcast, and they weren't paying attention. And so they're getting hit hard by the, the crash. Uh, or you're going to be able to hire a talent. So this is where you're spending that war chest and where you're out there uh, just acting. And so a lot of this gear is about the fact that you have to plan for this before we're in the recession because it's easy to start to pull back when we're in a recession to get nervous and to be the only one out there spending money buying companies when everybody else is just turtling up trying to survive. Yeah. And like in all the stuff that you're talking about too, like, I mean, if you're having conversations with your bank, if you got your cash flow built into a sustainable way, like we always preach, then like you're able, like everybody wants to work with you at that point. Like, I mean, banks are like, you know, there's going to be some corrections and, but you know, banks, the only way they make money is by lending. So they're going to want to still lend to good companies, right? And good companies will always be for sale. So like, I, I mean, it just, I don't know. It makes so much sense that it's ridiculous to me, but um, I think, you know, like you had said, like even with the assessment for the first gear is like understanding where you're at with your timeline and your ideal valuation, because like then that'll be able to layer on like what you want to race towards. I mean, what are you seeing, Jonathan, as far as like, yeah, I mean, people, I mean, you said that you got, you got had this workbook. I mean, are people gravitating towards this and what are some like tactical things that people are actually doing inside of that race thing that that are on their list of things that they want to do once it starts to to turn they want to like that that competitor the one that's uh always pissing you off (laughs) because they're always just undercutting you on a bid or the one that keeps picking off your a players because in the war for talent, they've decided that their only option is to pay your people 30% more than you're currently paying them. And you're like, you know, I know that they're going to go out of business if they keep doing that because they can't afford to pay people like that. But it still pisses you off because they're able to get the people to come over to them. And this gear, what you're doing is figuring out how you're going to be the one um, that's able to get the a, a talent and be able to buy that competitor in the recession. So they may be a competitor now, but in a recession, when the tide goes out and we can see that they've been swimming naked, that their balance sheet wasn't very strong, mm-hmm. then they might be a great tuck in acquisition for you. They might be a company that you can just go ahead and buy. And you've got to start that process now of courting them. Like you can't, um, if you wait until uh, they announce on CNN that we're in a recession, it's too late. You need to know what are the 10 companies that I would love to buy and you need to have conversations with them now. And I'm not saying you should be like, hey, Ryan, it's Jonathan. I'm calling because I want to buy your company in the recession. But (laughs) you you want to have friendly conversations with targets, with people that are friendly competition to just let them know what you're up to so that in the next recession, when they're like, you know, I'm in trouble here. I might have a bankruptcy on my hands, but you know, it sounds like Ryan's doing cool things. And you know, he's been talking to me every couple months. Maybe I'll call Ryan and see if he would want to buy my company. You want to be on everybody else's shortlist for their go-tos of who they're going to call in case they hit tough times. And you can't, you can't do that in a recession because it just looks opportunistic and it is. Mm -hmm. So we want, uh, like, that's the big part of the workbook is having some foresight, laying some groundwork so that in the actual downturn, you're their first call. Well, and I think it totally is applicable to both sides of the table and the aisle, right, Jonathan? Because like, even if you're like, so let's say like the timeline and you're, you know, you're getting older or whatever it is, if you're doing these right things, you'll be able to be on someone else's shortlist to be purchased for, and people will always pay good money and fair market money, fair market value for a good company. Right. So, I mean, it's literally both sides of the, of the coin. And I don't know if you, you know, in your book, if you specifically address this, but I also believe that if you're doing, you know, from the acquiring side, you know, there's, 
and again, I get this is applicable to both sides because you should be aware of this if you're going to be a seller. But like if you're the buyer, I don't think you're going to have to pay full purchase price and or all the money down. Like because people will be in dire situations, like you said, the tides are going to expose who's naked. People will have to get rid of the personal guarantees and their all their stuff. So they're going to have very low money down and probably an earn out or some sort of seller financing to get to, to just get out of it which is not a good situation. So no matter what, whether you're the acquirer, it's a good thing, but then the seller, avoid that. <laughs> At least try to avoid that. Yeah, I, I agree. <laughs> I, I know, it's, it, I know it, it's, it's hard to like see how important this is or, and without getting super <laughs> excited about it. In, in, is, if you're a listener, because I know we're kind of wrapping up here, Jonathan, what, what are things that they should do maybe in the assessment? Obviously we'll put links, links to the assessment, all this stuff in the, in the show notes, but really trying to assess where they're at in their timeline. Cause I think that's a big thing that people really need to understand. What are some of the questions you know, that they should be asking themselves to figure out whether they should be the one prepping to sell or prepping to acquire? Yeah. I, the, so the 20 questions um, are on the, the recession.com site. And it's things like, um, do you have a written plan for the next recession? Do you have 5 to 10% of your projected next 12 months of revenue and equity on your balance sheet? Do you have a board of advisors? Do you have a way at your company to measure productivity? Do you have an emergency break? Do you have a plan for, if all this stuff we're talking about, you know, Ryan, we're preaching all these different business hygiene pieces, all these things people should do to prepare. If it doesn't work though, and your company is going the wrong direction, if you're a million dollar business and all of a sudden it drops to 900,000 to 800,000, you should have an emergency break. Hmm. You should have a, a traditional recession plan for what overhead are you going to cut in what order so that you can just survive. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's critical to have too. It's that plan that I want you to write and have behind glass. And then if there's an emergency, you go break the glass and you pull the plan out. Because mm -hmm. otherwise, you're going to be acting out of emotion, or you're going to be kidding yourself. So it takes an incredible amount of self awareness, when things are going the wrong direction, to know when to pull the rip cord. Like when is it enough enough? When are you going to take action? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that, the emergency break, I think, I mean, that's a fantastic analogy. Obviously, it's very applicable to your guys' situation and not your what your, your your framework i mean it because no matter what you can't just expect that it's all going to be perfect i mean expect especially in a recession so it's it, what other things in that emergency break i mean what are some of the other things because i think that's something that people should be i mean doing regardless i mean like literally right away yeah well it, i would recommend a four-tier plan so the first tier is what are the expenses uh that we would cut right away so those are the more discretionary things mm -hmm. like you you know if you're if you've got athletic uh, sporting event tickets, those go as a tier one cut. If you have a third party cleaning your offices or mowing um, the lawn, then that could be a first round cut. At the second tier, as things get progressively deeper, then you're getting into now we're going to start um, taking away vehicle allowances. Now we're going to start having conversations with people about job sharing. Now we're going to start asking people to take early retirements. At tier three, that's where I would get into people changes. And so this would be where you're going to be laying off staff if you have to. And I want you to have it like, so if you're, you said earlier, um, you're telling me that at its height, your company had maybe 115 employees. Mm -hmm. So who are the people that are going to go in your first round of cuts? I want you to figure out of the 115, who are the 40 that go? so that you can cut once and cut deep, as opposed to what a lot of companies do, which is they fire three people on Friday. And then the next week, they're like, Oh, man, we got to fire three more, and then three more. And so it creates this culture, yeah. where every Friday, everybody's scared to come into work, because they don't know who the next three people are. And that really just erodes any chance you have at getting back on track. That's so, super like, I, exclamation point on that comment. <laughs> Yeah, and it's emotional. I mean, it, you want to plan this out now in the cool, rational light of day, as opposed to the heat of the night, because if we're already in a downturn, and say that, you know, you've got somebody on the team, Richard, 
and um, Richard doesn't really pull his weight. He's like that sled dog Nanook that I talked about earlier. But Richard comes into your office and is like, man, my wife just lost her job. And it's tough because my kids have special needs. And I'm trying to, you know, just make, you know, make sure that I can support them. And then Richard walks out of your office. You're really not going to want to fire Richard. But if you've already written down that he's one of the ones that has to go in your first round of cuts, that will help you to hold yourself and your leadership team accountable to do what needs to be done to protect the beehive. Mm -hmm. I love it. What was the tier four? I cut you off, I think. Yeah, tier four is where uh, the remaining people are going to start to take uh, reductions in their pay. So you've already made an, as much overhead cuts as you can. You've already um, laid off as many people as you can. The remaining people, you're down to your A players. Maybe your leadership team is taking 50% pay cuts and your upper management's taking 25% and everybody else at the company is taking 15%. I'm just making up numbers. Mm -hmm. The important part is to figure that out now for two reasons. The first is that it is impossible to have that conversation rationally once we're already in a downturn. So for me to come to you and be like, hey, Ryan, we're in a downturn. I'm going to have to cut your pay 25%. You're going to be like, what? But if I talk through it now with you and I'm like, if we ever have a downturn that's so severe that we get to this level of revenue, then we would activate our plan, which is to reduce management um, salaries uh, to, by 25%. That gives you an opportunity to process. It gives you an opportunity to go home and have a conversation with your spouse to come up with your personal recession plan of how you would make that work. And it gives you the comfort of knowing that you work for a company that has the foresight to talk this through and be transparent enough to have those tough conversations up front, which should give you comfort that you're never going to have to use the damn plan. I was just going to say, just the process of going through all that makes you as part of the 1% that are doing that, which means you're probably going to be just fine. <laughs> and if people don't get that and they're rolling their eyes because they're like, I, I couldn't have those conversations with my people, then the first step is for you to self-assess what that means about you and the people at your company. Mm -hmm. it, it's Isn't that so true? <laughs> what, um, what are the best places to get in touch and get, find the book, learn more about information, the, the assessment, and all that stuff. Yeah, so the book is on Amazon. If you just type in Rock the Recession, you'll find it. Uh, our website um, is recession.com, believe it or not. We were able to get that URL. I have no uh, idea and so, <laughs> how you guys did that. <laughs> yeah, um, we also, um, we picked up recessionproof.com as well. So both of those take you to the same spot though. Um, and that website has the recession readiness assessment. Like I said, that's free. So you just go to recession.com slash ready and you can take the assessment. You can have your whole team take it. It's free for everybody. It's interesting to see like if you take it and you score your company a 90 and then you have your, uh, your CFO take it or your head finance person and they score you a 70, that's a great conversation. Like why is there a big delta between what I'm scoring it and what you're seeing and then on the website, there's also, you can buy a copy of the workbook if you want it um, and all the other stuff that we sell and get in touch with me and Paul. Jonathan, this has been a blast, man. I enjoyed, uh, enjoyed the conversations. Cool. Yeah, and I'll, um, I can whip up a, uh, a coupon for your audience. Yeah, let's do that. Let's put it on because we're still on the record right now if you want to. All right, um, we'll, we'll have the coupon in the show notes for everybody. Perfect. Thanks so much for coming on. All right, thanks for having me, man. Tell your audience to rock on.